All right, greetings. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, guys. Good day from the Radiant Professionals Alliance across these beautiful fruited states and plains, and I uh, hope everybody is recovering from their comatose version of too much turkey and football. This is uh, Welcome to Hydronics Talk. By the way, this is a new name of our presentation. It was um, named by Mo Hirsch, by the way, who will be receiving a $50 gift card from the RPA so that he can go out and spend it on his lovely wife or whatever he would like to use it for. The um, previous attendees had voted on the names that were submitted, and we decided to go with Hydronic Talk primarily because we're so much more than just boilers these days. We've got heat pumps, air, water source, solar, biomass, everything, so it's now called Hydronic Talk, which is a presentation of the Radiant Professionals Alliance. This is Mark Etherton. I am your show host. I am the executive director of the RPA. I've been a contributing member for the last 20 years. I'm also a contributing editor of Contractor Magazine for the last 14 years. I've been an educator for 38 years, and I'm a former expert witness. I got tired of surrounding myself with lawyers, so decided to come to work for the RPA. I am a licensed master plumber in the state of Colorado. I still maintain that licensure. Over some quick rules of the road, please use headphones and boom mics if you would, please. Uh, mute your microphone if it's not already automatically muted to avoid any feedback and background noises coming in. Enter a question into the typing chat box if you would, please. And uh, then also any questions regarding the presentation, if you pull those, and we will respond to those after the presentation, and it will make the formal presentation move a little bit quicker. At the end, we will have an open question and answer session that uh, pertains either to the presentations that we've got or not. If you have something that you would just like to ask a question about in general, feel free to do so. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for taking time out of the busy Saturday to come and attend. Uh, here's a photograph of a radiant wall panel heating system that I'm a big fan of. I love radiant floors, but if we as an industry are going to move the needle and start capturing a greater percentage of the jobs that are going on out there, we are going to have to start doing it through the use of alternative, low-cost, radiant panel emitting systems. So I'm a big fan of radiant walls as well as radiant ceilings. And uh, this is a, a view of the rough end of the radiant ceiling that I did in my own house up in the mountains. And quite honestly, I think I like radiant ceilings better than I do radiant floors, because if I want to cover the floors with bare rugs, I can, and it will not have any effect on it. And as a part of my ongoing myth busting series, the floor of this home is not cold. I've actually got infrared thermography showing the floor is sitting at about 74, 75 degrees Fahrenheit when the ceiling is on. So that's one of those myths that everybody says, oh, the floor is cold. No, it's not. Radiant energy travels omnidirectionally through the path that least resistance. I think you get tired of saying that one of these days, but I never will. Uh, here's the only commercial that you will see for this whole show for the time being until we can sell some time slots. Join the Radiant Professionals Alliance. This is a very worthwhile organization. We have the creme de la creme as our instructors, and we have a lot of people that are coming online as our instructors that uh, are people that you really, really do want to get to know, uh, more than willing to share the information that they have and uh, provide you with a higher degree of education, which only adds to the professionalism in general. Let's go quickly through some hydronic news you can use. The AHR Expo will occur January 26th through the 28th in January of 2015, and for more information, you can click on that URL link and uh, show a lot of the information that's available from the AHR Expo. Uh, the RPA will be holding its annual meeting and educational programs in conjunction with the 2015 AHR in Chicago, and please stay tuned for more information on that. We have essentially six courses that we are putting on that, uh, in our eyes, are going to be fantastic. It's, it's uh, it's fun putting these courses together. I have access to some of this industry's finest instructors, and we are assembling them. If you attend the AHR, you'll be able to attend these classes for free. They will happen on Monday and on Wednesday. And then on Tuesday, we actually have our annual meeting and educational show, and then that evening, 
Uh, at a venue to be announced, we'll be having a pizza and beer session where we can get together and shoot and fat with some of the old members of the RPA and see what's new with them and see what's up. The uh, RPA University's fall course offerings are just starting to get online, and that is the whole reason that we put this show together. Um, we had originally not planned on having a show the very first weekend right after Thanksgiving, but timing was opportune, and we decided to go ahead and do a quick show on the uh, RPA U University and uh, heat spring courses that are available. Uh, we have, of course, Mr. Yates' class on the fundamentals of radiant design. Vaughn has another class on uh, a lecture, free lecture on four storage strategies for integrating solar and hydronic heating. And then he has another course that he's putting on that is basically a solar interface course of interfacing solar with hydronic radiant heating. So you get a chance, go to one of those URLs and check them out. Uh, I believe they've also got some good free test drives there where you can go in and check the system out and see exactly what it is that's going on. You'll remember previously I mentioned that I came to work for this organization to get away from lawyers, and little did I know I was going to surround myself with lawyers. I love these two lawyers, though. The uh, Bogats are some very nice people. They're not like all the other lawyers that are out there. And they require us to tell you that the graphics and illustrations presented in this webinar are presented for educational purposes only. RPA IATMO does not endorse or recommend the vendor product depicted, nor any vendor or product. RPA IATMO makes no representations, warranties, or guarantees as to and assumes no responsibility for the products depicted. And the RPA IATMO expressly disclaims all liability for damages of any kind arising out of the use or performance of vendors, products, services depicted. Enough of the legalese. <coughs> they make me do that every show. If I don't, I won't be able to do the show. So today's guests are Brian Hayden with HeatSpring. We have Dave Yates from FW Baylor Company, Vaughn Woodruff from InSource Renewables. We also have Ray Wolfarth, who I forgot to put onto this list and didn't have time to add him, but Ray is, Ray is working on a, a future program for us and is coming in here basically to get some feedback from those people that are attending to find out exactly what kind of a course they would like to see Ray put together. And Ray is a virtual human resource as it pertains to commercial hydronic heating systems. Uh, had him on a while back to talk about his two books. And uh, Ray and I have a lot of experience that we shared together over the waves here. And uh, I think that uh, you will find that Ray is very knowledgeable and more than willing to share his information with us. So with that said, here's Mr. Hayden. Look what I found on the internet. Uh -huh. Mr. Brian Hayden hanging out there. Brian. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey, doing great. I'm good. Where are you coming to us from today? I'm in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And how's the weather up there? Um, it is the the beginning of the gray season where uh, we all fall into a deep depression until we take a vacation to Florida. Yeah, this this is where people start selling those light boxes, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, welcome. Yep. Uh, tell us, how is it that Heat Spring got started in the first place. I've heard this story, but I think it should be interesting to a lot of the people that are here to find out exactly how it happened. I was in grad school at Babson College. Um, I was very excited about energy, uh, renewables, and, say, and energy efficiency. And I met uh, my co-founder, Duncan Miller, there. We were getting MBAs, and we were struggling to find a way to contribute um, as part of the industry, we um, we're not engineers. You know, I don't have a high regard for business people, um, even though I am one. You know, you sort of it's sort of a catch-all thing. So, you know, we we looked at a lot of different ways we could contribute and help and do our part, and uh, we wanted to become installers, but we just didn't really have the expertise to do it, and so we. Uh, started to find all these amazing people who were veterans and knew so much. And we thought, well, as business people, we can create audiences for those people and give them a microphone. And so we started running events where we would invite in you know, people who had, who, had, uh, who had written the book. And we started with Ground Source Heat Pumps, which is why Heat Spring made sense. And uh, so we... we started our first class was with Chuck Raymond, who's the author of the Igspa Manual, and we had him come to Boston and put on a three-day certification class. And it felt like 
we you know we were we were actually doing something valuable um, because Chuck you know he's been doing ground source seed pumps for thirty years but he felt like it was magic to be able to put a bunch that many people into a room to actually listen to them so uh, so anyway we, we we did a lot of in person workshops and uh, in '08 started uh, looking at online and doing online stuff. And at that time, it was very expensive to start building out online courses. But we we made some pretty heavy investments. And then nobody attended <laughs> those those online classes. And it's really only been in the last two or three years that the adoption's been there for, for online delivery of courses. So that's been a really exciting thing. You know, it, I wish it would have happened sooner, frankly. But um, it's nice to nice to be at a place where uh, the market is accepting what we're doing. Well, you know, I tell you, uh, got to give you kudos. I didn't know all of that information about how it is that you got started. So you, you did this based on the fact that you wanted to help veterans, which is a fantastic thing. And it's green, which is an even more fantastic thing. And you have your roots in the earth because you're doing ground source heat pumps. So I can't think of a better group to be involved with that uh, is providing educational services the way that you do. And I think that the really important thing about this, and it was really the key feature in us becoming involved, and by the way, John Siegenthaler was the one that strongly recommended that we get hooked up with you guys, and he'd, he'd already established a good rapport with you. And uh, in, in talking to John about it, he said the nice thing is that the students can take these classes when they have time, as opposed to saying you've got to be at the Internet at this time on this day, Otherwise, you're not going to be able to take the course, and that's not the way contractors work. Contractors are busy all the time, and they take every chance that they get to be able to learn, but it's never usually during rid of a business hours. So kudos to you for putting this all together, and I think it's worked out quite well to this point with the uh, two classes that we currently have up online. And uh, thank you very much for um, coming in and telling us about it. Um, if anybody gets a chance, Go to heatspring.com. There's the classes that the Radiant Professionals Alliance has up there, but there's a whole bunch of other classes up there that they offer that may have some interest to you. You know, if you're in the ground source heat pump business, uh, there may very well be some other classes that Brian has up there that would be of interest to you, or large scale solar, or solar PV, or it's just a it's a very large catalog of classes that they have available, and we're a small part of that, and we're, we're uh, very honored to be a part of that. But uh, if you get a chance, I would strongly recommend that you go check out Ryan's facilities and uh, take a look around, kick the tires, take a first spin, and see what you think. Got anything else to chime in on, Brian? Yeah, Mark, the only other thing I wanted to say is, so we tried um, all sorts of different approaches to doing classes online, and I think that you know, it's going to evolve over time what that means as technology gets better. But, you know, the things that stand out in a very crowded marketplace are the best instructors. So that to me has always been the number one priority. And so that's why between Vaughn um, and Dave and you and Ray, I mean, uh, if you don't have the best instructors, it's really hard to stand out. Um, in an online environment. So I feel lucky we work with you guys and, um, you know, Dave's class and Vaughn's class, if you look at the type of interaction that's happening in there, it's really special and it feels, it makes me proud to be associated with it. And um, so I want to thank you guys for that. Well, you're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Yates, I'm going to transfer the ball of power to you so that you can forward to these slides all on your very own, coming at you as we speak. There you are. Okay. What do I do to advance the slides, Mark? Just the very the top where it says Dave Yates, and there's a right-hand button. If you click on that right-hand button, it'll take you to the next slide. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, the course that I'm teaching is called the Fundamentals of Radiant Design. And it covers that, but it covers a lot more than just radiant. We also cover cast iron radiators, flat panel radiators, towel warmers, and baseboard hot water heat. Um, in effect, what we did was expand the course so that it's um, it's kind of like one call does it all. And we also cover uh, what Mark likes to refer to as forced error or hydro error. 
which is actually not forced air because hydro air actually is much more comfortable than a furnace-based air system. So the fundamentals of radiant design, we cover um, electrically commutated motors for circulators and how to sell radiant systems because they do cost more than, than air-based systems. So we cover the proper methods and, and approach with customers and we also cover how to upsell systems which is a pretty cool thing to be able to do. It's not uncommon for us to be able to upsell a system, have the highest price, and walk away with the contract. And the course objective, of course, is to put what this slide says to work for you. And the, the fact of the matter is that you can make enough money in this business that is lucrative or more lucrative than, for instance, being a drug dealer. Uh, it's pretty incredible what some of the profit potential is with this work. We also teach um, outdoor reset and how to properly approach that and determine what the upper and lower temperatures are based on the type of system that you have. And the emphasis in this course is on systems, not just on individual components. What my intent with this course was from day one was to have something that when you go through this course, you've got a rock solid foundation from which to build up and move on to these other courses. For instance, Mark is going to be doing advanced radiant. But we wanted to present, we wanted to present and build a rock solid foundation for the students. Um, and that's exactly the approach that we took. When someone goes through this course, they'll not only understand outdoor reset, they'll understand how to massage it to make it carve out the largest percentage of energy conservation value that you can get from any one of these systems. It's not unusual for us to, to find that after we've gone in and reworked a system that maybe doesn't perform very well, that they go from a system that they thought was providing them with good economy to one that now presents 50 to 70 percent reduction in energy, con uh, energy consumption. And of course, part of that has to do with the weather hours and the fact that, you know, interestingly enough, this is where we design systems for. Uh, for the last hundred years. And what those systems thought was that every time they turned on, it was two degrees or seven degrees or 13 degrees, which happens to be the default for our area of the country. But when you look at this chart, and this came out of one of my uh, geothermal programs to show what kind of run hours we have at each of these temperatures. And it's pretty obvious that if we're designing systems that run full tilt every time, thinking that it's 13 degrees Fahrenheit outdoors, and as the temperatures warm, the efficiency of those products diminishes, that there's a lot to be gained by going with modulating condensing equipment and properly um, adjusted outdoor reset. So, you know, outdoor reset plus low temperature equals lots of ECB or energy conservation value. And that's one of the basis with which I sell systems to our customers. And the question that always was in my mind is, why is there more ECB than the boiler plate ratings? If you look at just the plate ratings, it would only be a 14% difference. But the fact is, and Mark can back me on this, we see anywhere from 30 to 70% ECV when we're done with one of these systems. So during Mechanical Systems Week, Rich Truthui, the plumber from this old house, stated as fact that for every 3 degrees Fahrenheit we lower the system water temperature, we gain 1% in operating efficiency. And so I went back and looked at a couple of jobs that we had done where I knew that the owners, uh, for example, uh, Steve Wan's house, the guy that originally owned flat plate, had a 50% ECV on his house. And I went back and looked at the water temperatures, and sure enough, it was almost a three, enough, three to one ratio. So Richard's uh, statement proved to be pretty accurate. Now, it's not 100% bulletproof because it, none of these jobs came out exactly three to one, but they came pretty close. So with that, that must, there we go. When you look at the Beesman slide, you can see the relationship between water temperature and operating efficiency. The combustion efficiency is on the left column. You can see what a partial load looks like across the bottom column. And you follow up to where those two intersect. And for example, if you look at the green line at the top, that shows a high temperature of 104 and a low temperature of 86 on the reset curve. 
And you can see that by doing that, you maintain at least 95% efficiency and all the way up to just about 98.5%. If you look at the old standby uh, supply return of 167 and 140, the red line at the bottom, which would be kind of representative of the old style hot water baseboard, and see what kind of a, a damage effect that that has upon operating efficiency and why that's not a good way to run a system. And unfortunately, we see a lot of ModCon boilers installed that, uh, for whatever reason, the installers either didn't understand what they were doing or they used the instruction manual for knee pads. <laughs> and they either have not added out their reset at all, or they have out their reset, but they're still allowing the boiler to run up to its upper limit and have about a 20 degree range, treating it very much like you would have an old cast iron boiler. So practical application is you have to start with the heat loss, and we go through that and have exercises in the course that teach people how to do this by hand the way that we used to, but we also emphasize the fact that today there are a lot of online, or not online, so much as computer-based heat loss calculation programs that allow us to do an entire house, for example, in less than an hour. And then we go through and look at the heat emitters and the equivalent direct radiation on a room-by-room -room basis. We match that EDR output to the water temperature and trim the built-in fat because all of these programs have a little bit of fat built into them. And Then we talk also about using a thermostat with setback programming and how to accomplish that with the boilers that are out there today. And a number of them have a feature called Boost that after a program time period will actually ramp up their water temperature above your outdoor reset curve in order to satisfy the thermostat. And then we look at charts like this. This is an Excel spreadsheet that I made up, and this is from one of the exercises in the class. And the green represents, on a conversion from steam to hot water, what water temperatures are required for that uh, individual radiator in that room to meet the heat load. So when you go through that, you can see the difference between what we would have done for a steam boiler, for example, 182,598 BTUs versus what we actually need when we convert to hot water, which was just about 50,000 BTUs. So there, again, is another method that ex uh, example of how to carve out more ECB for each job. And when it comes to a standard hot water boiler and how difficult or how easy it is to make the change over to ModCon, it's really very simple. And here we have an ECM circulator. We've got three uh, Taco one watt zone valves and a three speed down here, ModCon boiler, closely spaced T's, primary loop, secondary loop, and you're off to the races. And you can also do this with oil. This was from a job over in Mannheim where we changed out an existing oil boiler that was four times larger than needed for the house, put in a boiler that was uh, pretty darn close to the heat loss, and a little tough to see, but up here is an ECM circulator, and we reduced their fuel usage in this house by more than 70%. The two-zone hot water baseboard system and an 87% efficient oil boiler. And this was from a steam to hot water job that we did for York Rescue Mission. Again, we carved out 70% ECV, went with a ModCon, an indirect, and this also has boost built into it, which has not had been used so far. And I think that wraps up pretty much what the course entails. We do a lot of field trips. Um, we get away from the book, off the pages, and do a a number of exercises that are over, above, and beyond what was in the original Radiant Basics program. So I look forward to having people in the class. It does uh, makes me feel good to be able to teach some of the things that I've been able to learn through the RPA, so I get to pay it forward. So back to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, I tell you, I actually ended up taking Dave's course, which I'm required to as the executive director of the association to make sure that he's not saying anything that shouldn't be said, which he didn't. Thank you, Dave. You're and, welcome. Um, I tell you, Dave put a lot of extra time and effort into this presentation. He started out with a basic slide presentation program that the RPA had been using for many years that John Sigenthaler developed, and then uh, significantly enhanced that. And I'll, I'll tell you what. 
Um, I like John Siegenthaler. John is, is a, a very good friend of mine. However, Jan, Don, John, John and Dan, Dan Hollihan, another good friend of mine, both fall into the same category in that neither one of them really has a lot of hands-on field experience like Dave has. And although their courses are fantastic, there isn't anything like being able to talk to somebody that has been there and done that and has the experience that can relate it to you and tell you exactly what to expect and what happens. So uh, if you're considering getting into the hydronic radiant heating business, I would strongly recommend that you consider taking this course to begin with. And if you intend to extrapolate your capabilities and move up onto the rooftop and start doing some solar, then that would take you into a Von Woodruff's world. And Von, I'm going to pass you the ball now. Thank you, Mark. Hang on a second. Let me get back up to the screen here. The ball is in your court, sir. All right, I get to get to move on. You the driver. See these poor people looking at my mug this morning or this afternoon. <laughs> Um, thanks for having me, Mark. It's uh, been a real privilege to work with RPA and IATMO uh, and HeatSpring uh, on solar approaches to radiant heating course uh, that we're currently offering. And so I'll, what I want to do is just kind of give you a sense of my background and just uh, for folks that are out there, be able to give you a little bit of a taste of what the course is about and, and why we even have this course. Um, you know, it's an inter it was an interesting course to build because people come into solar from so many different uh, backgrounds. You know, I came in with somewhat of a technical background with an engineering degree, uh, but not necessarily a trades background. Um, and then we, we get so many people that come in kind of from a wanting to figure out a way to do something with their hands. Uh, they'll help them address issues that they see as being critical. So typically folks with kind of a green mindset that are looking to put that into action. And so building this course is a challenge because we get, you know, we're serving folks that maybe have a very strong solar background but not a strong trades background. Um, or we also see people come in uh, into this portion of the industry uh, having a very strong, you know, traditional heating background but not a lot of uh, experience in solar. So that's kind of the, the audience that we have for this course and, and who, who we built this course for. Um, I was called to this course. I felt very fortunate uh, to be called on this. My, my background is one of, uh, I'm, I'm from Maine. Um, here in Maine, you have to be able to do lots of different things. Um, and I've been, you know, I have, a, I have a construction firm, a contracting firm. Our focus is on uh, solar heating systems as well as solar photovoltaic systems for generating electricity. Uh, we also do some work with uh, supplemental heat pumps, air source, mini splits, et cetera, and do general consulting uh, for clients in the state. I also, you know, it's coming to the time of year where a lot of contractors in my neck of the woods are probably out plowing driveways because uh, we get some downtime as the weather turns. Uh, I'm really fortunate that I've had the opportunity to, to spend a lot of my time during, during the winter uh, writing articles, doing training for organizations such as Heat Spring and RPA, um, written for magazines such as Home Power, uh, Solar Pro. Uh, I have an article on this particular topic and the current issues of PM and PME magazines. Uh, like I said, my background, uh, I have an undergraduate degree in civil engineering, um, as well as I have a graduate degree in education. Uh, I also have, you know, so that's my educational piece, but I really, I, I think the big value um, for my process of learning is actually have my hands out on the field. Uh, you know, you, you, think, you try and think about lots of things when you're crawling on your back in a crawl space through, you know, a de facto cat litter box. Uh, so gives a lot of chance to kind of think about the, the bigger issues. And I always find if I'm spending too much time in the office, uh, getting out in the field really helps solve some of the kind of bigger level problems and ask some of the questions that's really necessary for, for trying to build knowledge in this field. And then I sit on a bunch of committees uh, for organizations such as NABCEP. Uh, NABCEP is the third party certification for solar installers in North America. So they hold certifications that 
be kind of similar to the NAIT certification in the traditional heating realm. Uh, NABCEP is, you know, certifies professionals in solar heating, uh, solar, electric, or PV, as well as uh, they've got some programs for small wind. And then with IATMO, I just saw Mark out in California, which would be a lovely place to be today. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, uh, for the uh, Uniform Solar Energy and Hydronic Code meeting, uh, I sit on that committee, as well as a uh, committee for the Interstate Renewable Energy Council. All right, let's get past all that and get into this course. Um, and I always like to, you know, talk about, like, why is this course important? You know, we have heating systems, folks are out there maybe putting in propane, uh, putting in oil, putting in gas, um, dealing with heat pumps. You know, solar is another heat source. So, you know, w what's the big deal? Um, so this course was put together because that step can be a very difficult step. I'm going to show you here um, one of the systems that I've come across uh, in a consulting in a consulting standpoint. This is a system that was put in uh, several years ago when, you know, not only at the federal level but at the state level there was a lot of money put behind, uh, you know, the implementation of solar projects to help reduce our, our dependency on foreign oil. And so there was a, actually a fire station up in a rural community here in Maine where a contractor had gone out and said, listen, we got some money available from, uh, from our state agency. Uh, we want to put in uh, a solar assist for your radiant slab in the firehouse. And this is what the contractor walked into, you know, primary loop, basically heating a 40-gallon indirect water heater, very small hot water loads, uh, had in-floor radiant distribution, and just kind of a classic primary, primary loop that we see up here. Um, unfortunately, we see a lot of high-mass oil with radiant, um, which people are starting to learn some of the drawbacks on that. Um, and getting into more of the stuff that Dave's talking about. Um, but I just want to I just want to kind of show you the types of things that we see out there as to why this course is important. So the contractor came in and they had sat they sat through a three day course to get quote unquote certified in the state of Maine, which meant that they would get money to you know their projects would be eligible for the funds uh, available from the state for Im implementing solar. And so he, he did what he knew and had learned, which was basically to take solar collectors and put them on the roof, uh, tie them into an indirect water heater, and basically heat up a mass, in this case about 120 gallons of water. Uh, this was something that he was used to doing with domestic hot water. Now, if you look closely, you'll see a bunch of problems. We've got pumps that aren't buffered. Uh, you know. Just the way this is set up, it's it, it's buffered from the heat coil, but the you know it's it's pumping from the heat coil instead of putting the heat into the top of the coil. There there are a number of small issues here, nothing that are kind of the the silver bullet. But what happened? This this may have functioned properly, but when he began to integrate this into the rest of the system, uh, began to have some pretty significant problems. Uh, you notice that. You know, it's basically uh, closely spaced T's out of the primary loop. And with that high mass boiler, you know, these temperatures coming back need to be about 140 degrees for it to be really usable heat. And so solar is one of those technologies like we see with heat pumps um, where the lower that we can keep that the temperature that we're contributing to the system, the higher the efficiency will be. Uh, because the the cooler that we keep the collectors while they're producing, the less heat that they're going to uh, radiate and and lose out to the outdoor environment. And so, we he started by having an issue where he was having a difficult time really tying this in in an efficient way, uh, to the point where its contribution to both the floor and to the domestic hot water are pretty limited. So already another step of not really knowing how to best integrate this. Well, he took it up another notch when, you know, this is a system where, uh, you know, as you can imagine with a fire station, if, if, if there aren't a lot of hot water heating loads, which there don't tend to be, uh, or when they happen, they tend to happen in, in rushes, 
Uh, and then you may have many, many days with, you know, maybe some hand washing here and there. Um, so with solar, we don't have one of the differences between solar and a lot of the conventional heating sources that we see out there is that we can shut off a burner. We can't shut off the sun. And so overheating is one of the issues that really drives design in the solar side of the trade. And what ends up happening is, in particular systems, people will put in a heat dump uh, in which they try and protect their system by having a place to divert the heat uh, when it's not needed. You know, so ideally it would be a swimming pool or, you know, some high mass storage where they could, they could, they could put usable heat at some point. Uh, in some cases, and in this case, it wasn't usable heat, it was just a place to put heat that would keep the system from overheating. And so they use a thermostatic diverting valve that when the temperature was 170 degrees coming out of the collector would divert it to this baseboard element. So what ended up happening, right, if, if we're at 170 up here in a solar heating system, um, that usually means that we're dealing with a delta T usually of 25 to 30 degrees. So, you know, we're at 140 here. Well, if we're at 140 here and we need to contribute to this loop, you know, uh, that means this loop would probably need to be about 120. But at 120, we're going to have the issue with the condensing uh, at, at the high mass boiler. So what essentially happened was that this system ran, this was a $70,000 system that ran to move heat from collectors into outdoor baseboard, uh, which, you know, <laughs> that's not something that uh, the people that bought this system really are going to be excited about, and, and they clearly weren't. But for the industry, it's, uh, it's something that we don't like either because with any new technology, uh, you know, during its implementation phase, it's extremely important to show high quality because, you know, there are tons of ways that we can heat water. There are tons of ways that we can heat homes. And if it doesn't appear that a certain technology works, you know, if this is the first system in that town and the reputation that it has is that it just doesn't work versus it being a contractor issue, this isn't just an issue for the client, for the contractor, but for the whole trade. And so that's why when, you know, when I started talking with Mark, I was extremely uh, excited to, to build this course as a way to help support our industry uh, through its growth phase. You know, so this is, this is part of what goes on in week one of the course is that we're trying to contextualize why what we're doing is important, some of the key issues to look out for, the applications that make sense. Uh, I've actually highlighted three systems that I've come across, uh, sadly enough, um, that, we, that we named system integration gone bad, that kind of give us a chance to learn from other people's mistakes. So we take a look at three systems that kind of have the, you know, broken the cardinal rules of integrating solar uh, with space heating systems as, as a way for us to learn what are the things that to look out for and what are our design considerations when looking at these systems. Now, as I said, we have a variety of folks that are coming into this, and it's, it's not a huge leap from someone who has a lot of expertise in heating systems to move into, you know, the work uh, involved with integrating solar into those systems, but there are some unique characteristics of solar heating systems. Uh, like I said before, overheating is one of them, and we deal with uh, steam formation and stagnation, those are the types of events that can occur, uh, which create, you know, significant pressure issues that can be um, mitigated. Uh, we just need to know how to do it. If we approach a solar heating system like we approach a typical hydronic heating system, we're not going to have the protections and the design considerations we need to minimize service and to maximize the performance of those systems. So, what we do in the second week of the course is kind of after we've looked at the big picture context, we take a look at the basics of solar heating. So what does a simple domestic solar water heating system look like? You know, for instance, we see here a schematic of a, of a drain back system, and we look at all the different pieces and parts of the system. We look at how the system operates so that we can understand on the basic level how these systems work. So, you know, those folks that come into this, with limited to no experience with solar heating um, technologies, 
get a chance to see how these are different and how they're quite similar to other hydronic technologies. So this is uh, week two, then we step it up and we take a look at some of our larger systems. Uh, in this case, this is an antifreeze system. And we actually go through some, um, some, some uh, what's, what's the best word for it? We basically walk through what it looks like for the system to work on a typical day. We, we show temperatures in the system on a typical sunny day. Uh, we see how, the, how these temperatures and pressures change as the, as, the, as the day goes on, as we get more solar radiation. And it gives folks a chance to understand, you know, if you walk into a utility room and take a look at a solar heating system, you can't, you don't even really get a chance to see this. And so it, it's really important. We even have a ton of folks who have come in that, you know, we had a student that had been in this course, has been doing uh, uh, radiant and solar for 20 to 30 years. And just this different approach of taking a look at how overheating behaves and, and how that drives design he found that to be of huge value to him and something that even in his 20 to 30 years of work hadn't really had a chance to really analyze in this level of detail. And it's a, and it's a huge piece of what drives our design. So we take a look at this. We take a look at how these systems operate um, through simulations such as this. And we really take a look at stagnation. So that's week two is looking at these types of systems and understanding in, in closed loop antifreeze systems how stagnation occurs, uh, how it drives our design, and what we can do uh, to, to address it. Then we start to take a look at what is a, a critical piece, uh, something that's, you know, I've learned over time um, that standardization of these systems is really critical. Uh, you know, I was just having this conversation with my employees on the drive back the other day, which is, Every, every once in a while, we get a call from a client, and we just had one last week, where they, they start to fall into this gray area between the do-it-yourselfer and the person who wants you just to come in and do everything. Um, and early in my career, I would play around in that gray area a lot more and say, oh, yeah, we can do that, and we can do that. And with controls these days, you can do just about anything. Um, but I've, I've started to become more... Uh, <laughs> more um, Oh, what, what am I looking for? So I, I've come to respect more that someday I could be driving back on a really crappy day, hit a piece of black ice, my rig go, goes off the road, and if I, if I just created a system that could work because I knew how it worked and nobody else could understand it, um, the first time that system had an issue, uh, it's probably going to be totally changed, um, and it's really going to be a detriment to the owner of that system. So we've seen this, you know, not even in systems complex, uh, as integrating solar with, with space heating, but even just in systems that are used to take energy from the sun to heat domestic water. So we've seen in the industry different standards uh, that have come into play to help us uh, better, better have a framework for which to build our trade, uh, to have simple domestic water heating systems. But we we in the United States and in North America haven't kind of had the size of market yet to build those standards for space heating systems. Uh, in Europe, they have though, and so what we're going to take, what we take a look at in week three is really what are some standard off-the-shelf ways uh, that we can integrate solar and radiant. And, and we don't simply say, you know, here's manufacturer X and their system, here's manufacturer Y and their system. We take a look at, okay, here's an example for Manufacturer X, but here's really how this system works together and, and how this system is different from one for Manufacturer Y and Z, and, and when is the best time to utilize these different approaches for your type of project. That jumps into what I was talking about here uh, just a second ago, which are system standards. You know, these are the standards that we have for solar domestic water heating systems. And we talk a bit about these organizations. Um, and then we have the luxury of uh, Europe's, uh, excuse me, of Europe's um, experience in these systems. And, you know, in Germany, for instance, a huge portion of their solar heating industry are combi systems, uh, combination systems that utilize solar for domestic water as well as space heating. And 
There's a project called the CombiSoul Project where they basically looked at best practices uh, from five different countries in Europe and learned the lessons uh, through implementation of those systems that we haven't really had the chance in the U.S. to really um, to really focus on in the level they have in Europe. You know, our industry has historically been in California, Arizona, Florida, you know, not huge space heating markets, uh, whereas, you know, now we're seeing, uh, for instance, New England is becoming a huge hotbed of solar expansion. Um, we're seeing other northern, you know, mountain states like Colorado. Colorado's been in the mix for a long time. Uh, you know, we just haven't seen as robust a market as we have, say, heating domestic hot water in Arizona. And so what we're trying to do is bring bring that understanding. Uh, Mark, you know, Mark talked about John Siegenthaler earlier. One thing I appreciate about John is uh, in the solar side, he has brought over a lot of these lessons from Europe to help us better understand them out here. And so that's what we try and do in this course as well, is to take a look at the different codes and standards related uh, to these systems and provide the framework for folks that are just getting into this who have been into it for a while of, you know, it, it's nice to be in a, in a room with a bunch of other people who are doing the same thing you are to know if you're on the right track or not. And, you know, I, I'm in Maine, for instance. We don't have a ton of people that are doing this work out here. Uh, so my room is in, you know, talks like this or in, in national conferences. Or if I have standards and codes that other of my professional colleagues have put together collaboratively, um, and that, that's an important part for anyone that's getting into this. We also get into the codes as well. Uh, you know, for instance, one big thing with, with solar combi systems is we tend to store a lot of mass and we may store large volumes of water. And we take a look at, you know, what are the codes related to that uh, and how, how can we store large volumes without driving costs up so significantly that it takes this as a, as a viable option off the table. Um, in week five, we, you know, we get into Dave talked about the value in his course with sales and economics and, and how do we upsell. We talk about this in week five as well with, you know, what, what is the nature of selling these systems? What are the types of markets? Who are the clientele? How do we communicate to our clientele the value in these systems? Um, you know, in Maine, it's all about money. I got this, I, I started in this industry out in Bozeman, Montana, um, and my buddies out there, and you couldn't have two different markets <laughs> from where I am now in rural central Maine to Bozeman, Montana, where people spend, you know, tens of thousands of dollars on systems to heat their home with the sun when they could just as easily buy natural gas at about a buck a therm. So uh, through that experience, uh, as well as conversations with other colleagues across the country, you know, I feel like we've been able to really develop a strong understanding of what the markets are that are out there. Uh, you get a chance to see some interviews with, um, with professionals across the country who deal with this so that you can get some perspectives on the sales side. And then finally, the last week uh, is an opportunity to take the stuff that we've been talking about in the course, which, you know, obviously has to be somewhat formal since we've got to start with the framework, and really take it in week six to how it applies to your particular projects, the type of, types of things that you're trying to do. This is just a, uh, this is a, a sketch from one of the students in our first course. Uh, looking at uh, how to integrate a uh, solar heating system with a system that they are working on. They wanted feedback on this design to talk about, you know, what are some of the things that are done well, what are some ideas for things that we could do to make it more cost effective, uh, to better utilize the solar heat that's available, to increase the efficiency of the conventional systems that are used, et cetera. And that's, you know, for me, that's a really great opportunity for us to, um, apply this to what it is that's important to you uh, and to get into the real world. Um, you know, it's, it's great. We can sit here and talk all we want about, you know, the most ideal system, but, you know, it, it really comes down to what, what you come across in the field. And these systems, uh, solar heating in general, is very custom to the type of fuel that's being used in the home, the type of heating appliance, the type of heating distribution, et cetera, uh, and we try to standardize as much as possible, but, you know, it, depending on your market, 
uh, you may find that, you know, each system that you do, you may have to have, instead of having one or two go-to systems, you may need three or four and be able to adapt them to, to a, a variety of circumstances. So that's, that's the approach that this course takes. Um, been really fortunate to, to work with this gentleman. Look at how finely dressed this gentleman is. I'm sure he's not in his, in his pajamas today when we can't see him. But, uh, yeah, this is <laughs> too much information, Mark. Oh, sorry. <laughs> the, uh, you know, this is really the approach we're taking is I, I really like what Brian um, and the folks over at Heat Spring are doing because, you know, what they're doing is really giving the opportunity for, for professionals to come in and continue their education that already have a strong base and, and really step it up a notch. Uh, you know, I teach courses at a local community college with other organizations, and one of the challenges is as we get into these upper-level courses uh, that it's hard really to, to get enough people in physical seats to get into this content. So as a result, our industry at times never goes here because, you know, who's going to develop an, you know, a 40-hour course for three people once a year um, in Maine or in Colorado or wherever. Uh, and so this is the real opportunity uh, with HeatSpring and with RPA is to be able to have enough uh, a platform where folks from all over the place can come together. Uh, and it's been great just to see some of the discussions that go on as, you know, someone who's you know, over in Oregon and been doing this for decades and somebody who's up in British Columbia and has been, you know, teaching about this for a decade. Uh, there's really some rich places where I can just step back, actually, as an instructor and, and learn myself and, and give an opportunity for people to network and really teach one another and share their expertise. So thanks for letting me share mine, Mark, and yeah. You're absolutely welcome, Vi. I appreciate you being willing to join this whole organization. I know that you and I were kind of in the middle of a pretty heavy firestorm when we were discussing this during some of the uh, TC meetings out there in California, and I uh, appreciate you taking the time to put these courses together. I did want to go back and point out some, whoops, going the wrong direction here. I want to go back and point out some of the uh, pictures that you've got in some of your drawings here just so that they can let people know that silly people don't just reside in Colorado. They actually reside all <laughs> over the country. Uh, I love this parallel reverse return piping on these solar collectors. I mean, that, that's probably one of the stumbling points of most people is that they don't understand the difference between reverse return versus direct return. And if they collect, connected both of these systems of supply and return on one end, uh, they, you know, theoretically they'd go, well, i got a big enough pump that will force water all the way to the end of that array. <laughs> Such is not the case. Water is like my ex-brother-in-law, wet, lazy, and stupid. You have to show them the direction that you want the water to flow. Otherwise, it's going to go wherever it wants to, which is not where you want it to go. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's refreshing to know that I'm not the only person in the United States that gets to deal with people that have a tendency to uh, bumble and stumble. Uh, this drawing, I am guilty of having had done a lot of this as well as pretty much anybody that was in the industry at the time a lot of this was brought out was, you know, one big loop and then all of these secondaries that are coming off of it. And, you know, in theory, it looks really good, but when you stop and really start looking at what's going on there, it's like, oh, God, so what I produced out of the solar collector ended up going through that huge chunk of cast iron that is connected to a large chimney that has a natural draft action on it. So what I'm collecting from the sun, I'm sending back up through my chimney. And, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing that a lot of people just can't see that force for the trees and having someone with your experience come to the table and say, you don't want to do this because, then all of a sudden it sinks in and they go, oh, wow, I need to go back and change some systems. <laughs> but in any case, thank you very much for your time and your sharing of your information with the industry. It is uh, refreshing to have people with your capabilities coming into these classes. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome. Let me week my way back to... Here I am. Okay, the class that I'm going to be putting together, and I've actually got the slides put together, I'm in the process of actually recording them, is a course that was originally called Radiant Precision that was developed for us by John Siegenthaler, along with some other people that were on the technical committee at the time with the RPA. And this is really more of a technical designer's course. And there are, you know, there's 
numerous manufacturer courses that are available out there, and God bless them. They're all doing a fantastic job of taking what used to be a former plumber and converting them into somebody that really knows what it is that they're doing in the field. But there's a lot of things that they don't have a grasp on that um, I should explain a part of what we're doing within the RPA is we are also developing an IAPMO standard that is being developed through ASSE that will be an anti-recognized standard as it pertains to hydronic heating system designers and installers. And this course, once it's completely put together, will be the prerequisites for a person being able to go in and take that certification program. If you want to go in and take it without taking these courses, you're more than welcome to. But if you fail that class, you're going to have to pay a second time to go back in, and then you will want to take these classes so that you can make sure that you pass it. Um, there are a lot of other hydronic certification programs out there, but they are not an ANSI-recognized program. There's NATE programs. There's um, also NATE from Canada programs, as well as state programs up in Canada, but none of them carry the weight of this ANSI-recognized certification. And it's our intent to raise the bar for the industry as a whole. And the RPA used to have its own certification program, but it was only recognized by the RPA. And it was great for the members, and it was kind of a very empowering thing to have had taken these courses and be able to stick that sticker up on your wall that says, I took these courses and I know what I'm doing. But this is going to be a program that will be recognized uh, by the American National Standards Institute, uh, developed under the open consensus process, which is the same process we use for developing codes. And um, if you want to take that course, my strong recommendation would be that you take both the Fundamentals of Radiant Design as well as the Radiant Precision course, and uh, probably would not hurt to augment yourself with some of the stuff that Vaughn's got up there because a part of the same standard of certification is also going to be for solar designers and installers, which that's news to Vaughn. I haven't had a chance to talk to him about it yet, but uh, part of the 19,000 series of standards will include solar thermal, uh, hydronics, as well as ground source heat pump. And we're in the process of assembling our subject matter experts so that we can move forward through this process and developing the uh, professional qualification standards along with the test and everything that goes along. So this Radiant Precision course is basically going to get into a lot of the formulas and calculations that most contractors in the field don't have to deal with. And the reason that they don't have to deal with it is that in a lot of cases, they're leaning on their wholesale supplier to do these calculations for them, which is fine. If that's the avenue that you choose to do, feel free to do so, but bear in mind that if something goes wrong with their design, you're responsible for it. And you can point the finger of blame at everybody you want, but your signature is on a contract to that consumer, and in the eyes of the court, you are the responsible party to make sure that the system does what you said it will do. And so it's important to understand, if nothing else, the basics of these systems so that if you get a design from one of your wholesale suppliers that doesn't look quite right, that you have the knowledge and ability to be able to go into these programs and see exactly what it is that's going on and make sure that the story that they're telling is going to match the story that you're telling and that you're not going to be making promises above and beyond what you're capable of doing. So we go into some of these formulas, which you know, I know a lot of people, these formulas make their eyes close and glaze over and they want to go to sleep, but it's necessary to understand these things. And this is just a simple calculation showing what it is that you're going to be able to get in the way of BTUs per square foot per hour. And most people, including numerous of my former employers, use the rule of thumb. And that rule of thumb is no radium floor heating system can put out more than 30 BTUs per square foot per hour. End of conversation. And they don't know why. And it's like, okay, well, why is it? Why is that floor limited to 30 BTUs per square foot per hour? Well, the major limitation is that you cannot have a surface that's greater than 85 degrees Fahrenheit in contact with a human being. If you do, that human being is going to go into a protective mode, try to keep their core from overheating. I call it evapotranspiration. My wife calls it sweating. And it's not a pretty sight. So understanding a lot of these reasons and how these numbers come about are very important in making sure that you've got a grasp that if the guy says, okay, I've got a load of 40 BTUs per square foot per hour because this room is completely surrounded with glass all the way around. 
Well, guess what? You're going to need something above and beyond the radiant floor heating system to do it. And there are also the advantages of going with a radiant ceiling that you're not in contact with that can deliver more BTUs per square foot per hour than the radiant floor can. I'm not trying to take people away from radiant floors. I think they're the most fantastic thing in the world, but the simple truth of the matter is Joe and Jane six-pack who are out there on the streets wanting to have a good, comfortable nest cannot afford radiant floors. They would like to have radiant comfort, but there are many other ways of being able to deliver good radiant comfort without having to heat the floors up. Uh, the theory of outdoor reset controls. As Dave mentioned, I think this is one area that most contractors run like chickens from. They don't want to get that call when it's design condition outside from their client saying, I'm uncomfortable. And neither does the engineer that designed it or the wholesaler, whoever you happen to use. So everybody has a tendency to have it, to oversize every component of that system, not just the emitters, but the pumps and, and the boilers and everything. And Dave and I run into this all the time. I mean, it's, it's actually a valuable tool from the standpoint of being able to show energy conservation value, as, as Dave has pointed out, because there are so many people that are so afraid of it. I mean, I've seen engineers that will say, okay, the load comes in at 20 BTUs per square foot. Let's call it 40. Holy cow, you just doubled the load, and that's what the contractor is going to size his physical plan around. And then when the thing starts short cycling itself to death, they point the finger of blame at the contractor. But when he turns around and tries to point it at the engineer, they're going to go, huh? No, you, you had every opportunity to look at our work, and you didn't question it, so it is what it is, and, and you're going to have to deal with it. So it's, it's important to understand these controls and to be able to apply them. One of the classes that we'll be putting on during AHR is the uh, connected controls, all of the Internet-based PC controls that are available now, not just thermostats, but some of the PC-based operating systems that you can get alarms from your house telling you that a certain room is too cool or that the reaction time is too slow and you know, the ability to be able to manipulate room temperatures from anywhere in the world that you've got an Internet connection is a fantastic world. And it's not something that was available to us when we first started doing these systems, I guarantee you. So here's the different ranges of what you've got available and what their temperature requirements are going to be between 110 and 180 degrees. And as Dave said, most contractors set it for that highest temperature walk away from it because they don't want to hear the complaints. And it's, that's just not the right thing to do. The right thing to do is to understand your limitations and to apply them in the field. And I know that Kurt Albershard is listening in here. He's the kind of guy that will go in there and tweak it. He'll turn it down even lower than what the numbers theoretically came in because there are so many things that we don't take into consideration in our load calculations that have a direct impact and influence on these systems, that there is room to be able to turn things down. And, and every time you turn it down is going to create additional energy conservation. And we want to prove to the world that we are, without a doubt, the most efficient system in the world. And that requires us having to be able to show proof. And the only way that you're going to be able to show proof is to understand the theory of outdoor reset control, apply it appropriately, Tweak it as necessary. In some cases, you may be turning it up. In most cases, you'll be turning it down. But uh, in any case, I about thirty percent, Mark. Thirty percent lower than what they're showing. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't doubt that a bit. I know it, I, I've seen it in my own personal house. I mean, theoretically, sixty-five degrees Fahrenheit is what they call the neutral energy balance point. And I played with my own house here in Denver, which is there's really nothing super about it. It's just a conventional old nineteen fifty-three home. And uh, I've determined that my actual balance point is 40 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> you know, and people go, well, you can't do that. You know, the math says you can't do that. Well, I don't care what the math says. The math also said that I needed 100,000 BTUs an hour worth of heat in my house. And I stuck in a 50,000 BTU per hour boiler, and I've never been uncomfortable in this home. So even though the theoretics say this is what you've got to do, this is the rigid way that you want to do it, and as a good contractor, you will do it that way. But with the use of these outdoor reset controls, you can tweak these systems and fine-tune them and get them into a position where it's going to provide the ultimate comfort and the ultimate in energy conservation. Uh, proportional reset control gives you the ability to be able to control multiple loads. We had this conversation during our recent hearings with the code authorities that were developing the codes under the Uniform Solar Energy and Hydronics Code. Uh, somebody came up with a really good idea of putting a manual reset high limit on the heat source that would be set for 20 degrees higher 
than the highest water temperature required for a radiant floor heating system. And I said, well, you know, in theory that sounds really good and I understand what it is that you're trying to protect, but I have the ability to be able to use panel radiators, hot water baseboard, fan coil units, radiant floors, and numerous different applications requiring water temperatures between 110 and 180. So what temperature should I set that manner reset for to avoid nuisance lockouts? They didn't know. They couldn't give me an answer. They were just kind of dumbfounded that we could actually do this. And this is a prime example of what we can do. We can have one heat source, and in this particular case, it's showing four different temperatures of operation. We have the ability to be able to do this. You just have to understand your limitations and understand what all the requirements are that you've got to do to set these systems up so that they work correctly. You'll end up with a consumer that's extremely comfortable, very happy, and has some of the lowest energy bills that are available. That's all there is to it. So that's the end of my spiel. Now that I'm done talking on that part, are there any questions in my regards? And I don't see anything that's popping up here on uh, either the Q&A session or in the chat session. So I want to turn this over right now. I'm going to go back one slide just so that we're not looking at all those strange email addresses. Um, to Ray Wolfarth. Ray? Uh, hello, everybody, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to um, to talk with them. Um, I'm going to be putting together a course on connecting new boilers to old pipes. Um, this all started, the reason I wrote my book on this was that I would talk with engineers, and, and they would think that they're going to get this ModCon boiler, put it inside there, and they're going to get 98% efficiency throughout every day of heating. And I would try to explain to these people that you're, you're going to be lucky to get that kind of efficiency because the system was designed under a whole different era. Uh, you know, since 1899, they've been designed to run on 180 degrees at the design temperature outside. Now, there's ways you can tweak that and opportunity, you know, um, cut your heating and, and your um, cost, but. Similar to what Dave said and what Mark said was you, you really have to go in and look at a room-by-room -room basis. Uh, did they put new windows in? You know, do a heat loss for each room and see what your heat emitter is sized for. Can we effectively running for 130 degrees? Um, what a lot of people don't understand, too, is you're not going to get fully condensing mode till you're below 100 degrees. Um, you know, you're going to start to condense, but you won't hit 90% efficiency until your water temperature is below 100 degrees. Well, can your existing radiator, cast iron radiator or fin tube radiation, can that throw any heat off at that temperature? And so I get them to look at it as a system. Um, some of the other things we see on commercial systems is you'll have uh, two boilers that were each size for 75% of the load. So on the coldest day of the year, our heating plant was oversized by 50%. Um, when you start to come down, in, in our Pittsburgh area where I'm from, it uh, design temperature is for 7 degrees, and we'll have about 20 hours a year at 7 degrees. Well, the 98% the of your heating system is above that. You're not going to need 180 degrees. And you've got to be able to tweak it and try to find some ways you can still make it comfortable without overheating the space. Uh, that's what I'm going to be looking to do is, is to try to look at an existing system and and see what you're dealt. I mean, can you use the existing flu? Are you going to uh, go out through the sidewall with it? If You know, what are the drawbacks to using outdoor air combustion air? Um, you know, how does it affect the efficiency of it? Uh, what about the existing pump? Can we reuse the existing pump or should we go with a new pump? Um, what about the electrical or the gas pressure that's available? And I, I'm going to just take them on a typical project and, and look at it and come up with ways that what can you put in that's the best efficiency. Now, people are, you know, ask me, why are you so concerned with this? Well, every day we're losing more and more market share to these VRF systems, and, and we have to be able to provide some sort of a, an efficient, comfortable system. And without... Uh, without looking or knowing what we're doing, we're providing a system that, and we've, we've become that low fruit, low hanging fruit that those people can come in and take over and show what kind of efficiency we're going to be giving to people. 
So. Excellent, Ray. Um, Kurt Albuchart had actually typed in a recommendation on something that he would like to see coming in in the way of the class, and that's teaching on how to get the most work out of our mechanical systems while using the least amount of energy, which I think you addressed. Right. And, uh, or how our systems interact with the reservoirs into which we are heating, which, you know, Kurt and I and numerous other people that are on this forum have had this conversation many times that I have yet to come across a heat loss calculation program that takes into consider consideration the flywheel mass effect of the construction of the building itself. And a lot of them will take into consideration the internal gains, the electrical gains, the fenestration gains, the body gains, the computer gains, et cetera, but none of them are really looking at the effect of mass. And in the case of commercial buildings where you've got a lot of isolated mass, it makes all the difference in the world. And I really feel that that's the reason that we're not seeing boilers doing 100% duty cycle, even though we know for a fact they were properly sized. When we show up at design condition and we see the thing doing a 50% duty cycle, it tells me that either the load is not what we thought it was going to be, or the physical plan is twice as large as it really needed to be, or both. And if we downsize that, as I did in my house, then we get into a situation where it matches perfectly. So our job of education will never end, and our job of research and development should never end. And uh, we will continue moving on and figuring out exactly where all of these issues are at so that we can fine-tune this science. Um, one thing that I'm really into right now is a project called benchmarking which from the standpoint of being able to do some direct comparison analysis of, say, a gas-forced air system versus a hydronic-forced system versus an air source heat pump, a water source heat pump, whatever you want, uh, a lot of larger cities, New York, Chicago, Boston, L.A., are doing this benchmarking program where they can actually take a look at a building and say, okay, this building's parameters are that it's this many square feet, it's this percentage of exterior glazing, it has uh, this type of occupancy, and it's energy consumption per square foot per degree fair, per degree uh, day of, of heating cooling application are this. And their original intent was to give people the ability to be able to go in and look at buildings and find a building that was really green. But what it shows me being on the inside of this industry is that hydronics is on the top of the pile as it pertains to system overall design efficiency. We've got it down pat but we need to fine-tune it even more so that we can make it more cost-effective to the consumer, and we can do that through these historic data that we have access to. And I've taken it even a step further. I've had projects before where the buildings were built in the 60s, and they said, we want to put new boilers in here, but we're not sure how big. And, you know, we did a loss calculation on the building, and the loss calculations came back and said that the boiler that we have is three times bigger than it should be, but we need a means of verification. Well, through data logging, which I've been a large fan of for many years, uh, we're able to actually break it down into a degree minute. In other words, I can look at the worst case scenario exposure of temperature for a given situation and take those numbers and chop them up into degree minutes instead of degree hours. And then you get the ability to be able to go, wow, okay, look, here's what our load really is. It takes into consideration the flywheel mass effect, it takes into consideration all internal gains, and it fine-tunes the load to the point where you're comfortable saying, well, you need a boiler this big. This is what the numbers prove. <laughs> so it's, it's uh, never-ending, and Ray, thank you very much for considering putting a course together for us. I'm, I'm uh, really anxious to see what it is that you plan on putting together for us so that we can move forward with this. And, provide additional education services to uh, all of our members and, and guests. And they'll have to be a member of the RPA to attend these classes. Well, I'm looking forward to it. And uh, there's some stiff competition here. I'll have to watch out for Dave. And, and uh, he's, he's one of the sharpest people out there. So I'll have to make sure everything's well, my my uh, T's are crossed, my eyes are dotted when Dave looks at them, but and, and you, Mark, as well. So I look forward to it, and thank you for the opportunity. You're quite welcome. And this brings us to the last segment of this program, which is whether well, anybody has any questions. Let me see. I've got a red Q and A file going here. Let me see if I can figure out what it is that uh, somebody was asking me. Slide that a sink. No, we're not.
Never mind. Kurt thought they were, but we actually didn't have any slides set up for Ray. Ray kind of popped up at the last second there, and I definitely wanted him to come in and speak to uh, what it was that he was planning on putting together. And would love to see you put some courses together as it pertains to some of the articles that you've written as well, Ray, some uh, commercial boiler setup applications and you know, worst case scenarios because the commercial, although it seems to be somewhat of an exclusive area, I started out residentially and moved into the commercial segment by default. Uh, by default of the fact that there was nothing to do on the residential side and there was a lot to do on the commercial side, so I took what I knew into the commercial boiler rooms and uh, progressed and learned from there. So, yeah, anything that you could do for us in the way of a commercial class, I think, would be very well received. Thank you. You're quite welcome. So I don't see any other questions as it pertains to the presentations that have just gotten done. So we will move further into the rest of the program, which is the open question and answer session. And as I mentioned before, uh, we have yet to have anybody bring a question to one of these sessions. We're either doing a fantastic job of education or we're into that scenario where the guy sitting next to you doesn't want to ask a question because he doesn't want to look stupid. And there are no such thing as stupid questions, just silly mistakes made by people that didn't ask questions. So if you have a question, by all means, feel free to bring it forward. <coughs> Pardon me. The um, Direct your questions to me via the chat box, and then I'll send them out for anybody in general. Hang on, I've got somebody that's talking to us in the chat. Never mind. There's the same question about the slides being out of synchronicity. And um, so we obviously have no questions as it pertains to general hydronics, so I've added a new segment. And the new segment on this show is now going to be the hydronic tip of the week. If you guys don't want to get up and talk, then I will, and I will give you some things that will help you be a better mechanic in the field. Uh, how many times have you been in a scenario where you've got remote piping and you have no idea whether or not you've got flow in that system or not, and you suspect that you don't because of the people are complaining about a temperature condition that is not ideal. Um, if you've got a ball valve there, it's a very simple matter of being able to close that ball valve real quickly with the circulator running, and you will hear a hydraulic hiss as that flow is choked off. Just close the ball valve real quick, and you'll hear it go shh, shh, or you'll see the pipe jump from the kinetic energy that's in that water that's moving that comes to a sudden halt. But you don't always have that valve available to be able to perform that test. So as you can see on the screen here, I had an older plumber that showed me a trick one time. He said, use your torch. He said, to be able to perform this test, basically you want to do it with the circulators on. The system obviously needs to be filled and assume that you've got flow everywhere, but you want your heat source off. And you walk over to this pipe in question and apply torch flame directly to the pipe for five seconds and then take it off, turn it off, and then count for five seconds, and then carefully apply an open hand to the pipe. If it's still hot, you don't have any flow. But if it's not hot and it's cool, then basically you have flow because if you didn't have flow, that pipe would still be very hot. Oops, going the wrong direction here. So that is the tip of the week. You guys ever had a chance to use something like that before? No, I've, I've I've never used that before. That seems like a pretty good idea. I've always I always try to use the screwdriver on the pipe to the ear method to see if I have flow going through the pipes. I've done that, and I'm sure Dave probably has too. I don't know of a mechanic that hasn't. But the problem with that is if you've got a noisy bearing assembly, all you can hear is that bearing assembly. <laughs> wow, wow, wow! Well, it sounds like it's moving water, but I can't really tell. Um, they, they've got some really cool instruments out now that's it's called the Doppler flow detector. Unfortunately, the cost is still pretty expensive on them. I think the last one I saw was up in uh, Oregon was about twenty thousand dollars, but it's it's very accurate. It it you know I can't tell you exactly how it works, but you clamp two devices onto a pipe and you measure the distance between them and you put that into a computer and it will tell you whether or not you've got flow and it will tell you how much flow you've got. Wow. And it's, it's a fantastic tool, but as I said, it's not inexpensive, and it also requires some training to be able to utilize it. Um, I have had an occasion before where we had a leak 
an underground district pipe heating system that we had to locate, and we were using this Doppler leak detection system, which a lot of cities will use. And the technician that came out latched under the pipe, and he was looking at the screen, and he had this question mark on his forehead, and I'm like, what's wrong? And he says, it says the leak is behind us. And I said, no, it couldn't be, because the water's coming out right here. And he said, well, he said, this thing's never lights. And he says, it's telling me the leak's not there. It's telling me that the leak is way upstream. And sure enough, he was right. We ended up inadvertently discovering the leak was in the floor of an apartment building that was not even the building we were looking at. And uh, <laughs> the only reason that I happened to notice it is I was walking by with my infrared camera in our garden level porch, the concrete slab outside was about 110 degrees Fahrenheit, and it was about 20 degrees and snowing outside. And, uh, holy cow, I think we found the leak. But uh, in any case, uh, these Doppler leak detectors are really a cool tool. If you don't own one, in certain situations, you can find a contractor that has a Doppler leak detector that can help you out in uh, locating these flows or leak detections or whatever it is that you're looking for. So that's basically our show for this session. Again, I would like to uh, thank all of my guests, and I want to make sure that I've got everybody right. I just unmuted you. Vaughn, I just unmuted you. I want to uh, thank you all for taking time out of your very busy schedules to come in and to attend us. And I uh, would like to let you know also that normally these shows are available only to members only of the RPA. They are archived for them. Our first three shows were available to the public in general, but this show will also be available to the public in general because it is really directed more towards the general public as opposed to our members only. So if uh, you have anybody that is interested in seeing this information after the fact, as soon as I get it downloaded and recorded from uh, my staff at IATMO in Mokina next week, I will get it posted to the RPA website, and it will be available for anybody that has an interest in coming out and seeing it. And again, thank you all very much for taking time out of your schedule to come and attend, not only as a participant, but also as our honored guest. And I look forward to seeing you during the next show, which happens in two weeks. And we will be featuring the Swing Green Team which has a line of products that pertains to drain and refrigerant waste heat recovery products. Uh, that course will actually be presented on December 13th at 12 noon Eastern time. And I can tell you from personal experience that these things are fantastic. I do not understand why they are not mandatory under the provisions of the code. They reduce the energy consumption for domestic hot water consumption by like 50%. And I understand that there's not an applicability for every one of these because the seed exchanger has to be installed in a vertical position. But in those situations where you can apply them, it should be applied, and, and they are fantastic. So if you want to learn more about this, as well as some of the refrigerant waste heat recovery systems that are available on the market, uh, by all means, tune in on December 13th at 12 noon Eastern. And uh, we will have the Swing Green team show you everything that they know about doing this, and they've been doing it for a long time. So Vaughn, Dave, Ryan, Ray, thank you all very much for attending. And thank you, I look, Mark. You're quite welcome. I look forward to working with all of you folks in the very near future. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, everybody. Have a good holiday, everyone. You bet. Take care. Thanks. Bye.